morning, everyone. We're excited to have you here this this morning. Uh, we want to start off because it is a special Sunday. It is Palm Sunday, one where we get to stop and focus on the whole triumphal entry that's leading up to the Resurrection Sunday. As we get ready to worship today, we want to just read a scripture from Luke uh, 19. Jesus is in the triumphal entry and he's already gotten on the colt and he's riding into town. And as he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for the wonderful miracles that they had seen. Blessings on the King, they cried out, who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, and glory in the highest heavens. What a great triumphal scene of worship, and the people are laying down the red carpet treatment for the one they are proclaiming King. And yet not everybody did. Verse 39 says, But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, they lowered Jesus from king to just a teacher. Rebuke your followers for saying things like that, they proclaimed. And here the king, who's in the triumphal entry, turns and he replies, If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst out into cheers. The world's going to hate it when we truly worship the King. So as we come to this time of worship where we're going to join together as a family, as a body, as the church, let us put to shame any rock that may try to cry out. Let us be the ones that shout and cheer the King is alive. Let's stand and let's go to God. Father, we thank you for being the Son, for being the King in our God. Lord, as we lift up our voices in a moment, as we proclaim who you are, we ask that this would just be a, a blessing to your name, that it will be honoring to who you are and what you have done to us through, your, through you, your Son, and your Spirit. God, we praise you and may this be pleasing to your ear. In Jesus, we all pray. Amen. I'm 
Isaiah 25, 1 says, Lord, you are my God. I exalt you and praise your name. You in perfect faithfulness, for in perfect faithfulness, you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. 
Mike Mills. I have had the blessing in my life to uh, be able to serve this church as a deacon. This church has been a part of my life. It has drawn me closer to our Lord. This church has celebrated with me, it's laughed with me, it's sang and danced and helped me celebrate some of the best times of my entire life. This church also cried with me. It's lifted me up. 
has prayed with me, has prayed for me, has made me part of the family. So again, good morning. If you're here in the house of the Lord today, the Holy Spirit touched your heart and brought you here. If you're here in the house of the Lord today, this church family wants to know, no matter if you've been here a thousand times or if this is your first time, you are welcome here. If you feel lost, if you're looking for something to point the way, if your heart is aching with fear, with pain, with just an empty feeling of being alone, our Lord and Savior loves you. Sin, pain, loneliness, any of the grief that this world could dish out, Jesus is the Savior. He's the light in the darkest hour, and He will heal your soul. Ask him, for, ask him for forgiveness. <clears throat> ask Him to come into your heart and to make you whole. Jesus willingly went to suffer and die on that cross for each and every one of us. He will forgive your sins. He will open His arms and hold you with a love that will give you peace and comfort that you will never find anywhere else. As we take communion, let your heart connect with Him. Thank Him for the pain and suffering that on that cross. Thank Him for His grace for all of us and forgiving our sin. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, thank you for the love and grace of your Son, Jesus. Thank you for this church family. Thank you for this wonderful country we live in. Please give us strength to stand up to the evil that is trying to divide us. We pray for all good things. In the name of Jesus, amen. Um, junior church, four years old through fourth grade, you are dismissed to walk now. We're in the middle of a sermon series titled The King. And so far this year, we've looked, been looking at the life of David. And last week, we saw how David finally has become king of Israel. It's taken him 15 years to get to this point. It's been a rough road. 
In Romans 15, verse 4, the Apostle Paul says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in Scripture and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. This is something we desperately need in this time. We need hope. There's a lot of things in the world that are tearing out that, that are trying to undermine the idea of hope. And Paul knew that one of the best ways for Christ followers to grow and mature in their faith was to grab onto the one thing that can give you hope. In Sunday school, we actually kind of went over this, and it was you have to hear the message and then what? Fear, which means this, um, not scared, trembling, but this awe of authority of how great it is. And so once I hear it and I fear it, then I obey it. And Paul knew that the more people would study, the disciples would study the Word of God, the more they'd allow the Holy Spirit to lead them and guide them into experiencing a deeper relationship with God. As we continue this Easter series titled The King, we come to, we come to my favorite event of King David. This is by far my easiest favorite event of David, but we have to get some background first. So if you have your Bibles, digital or physical, turn to chapters 4 and 5. And the, the children of Israel are getting ready at this point to go to war against the Philistines. At this point, spiritually, the Israelites were on a decline. They were leaving God. They were going lower and lower away from God. The high priest, Eli and his sons, their spiritual leaders, had failed to teach and lead the people towards the true and proper way of God. And as a result, the people came to believe that the Ark of the Covenant was nothing special except, well, they took it into battle and they thought, if I carry this Ark, nothing can beat us. We will never defeat it. They saw the Ark of the Covenant as a lucky charm. Okay, so uh, a lot, I like hockey, guys. Okay? It's the real sport. That's how I feel it. Okay, it takes all the great things about these other sports and puts it on ice. Okay, and it's really cool. Do you know what a lot of the guys do during playoffs? They, they, no, that's the benefit. They don't shave. That's part of their good luck. They, they don't shave. And their hope is that as long as they've got a beard, they're going to keep winning. And in baseball, there are guys who will not change their socks or undies. They wear the exact same ones during all the games. Makes hockey look a little better, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay? But they see these things as good luck charms, something that just aids them. Is there any power in them? No. Is it really those things? No. And they demoted the Ark of the Covenant to a rabbit's foot. However, God does not play that game. And instead of Israel being victorious that time... By using the Ark of the Covenant that way, they were defeated, and the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant. Now, in the same line of thinking, what would that mean to the Israelites? The favor of God, their lucky charm, is now on their enemy. So the Philistines, they take the Ark of the Covenant, and they go put it as a trophy in the temple of their god, um, Dagon. This idol of Dagon, they go and place it there to show that their God is better. They thought, this is going to, hey, we might get double protection. We have Dagon who gave us the victory, and now this God of the Israelites who's symbolized by this shrine, and they put it there. The next morning when they went into the temple, the idol of Dagon fell down and was face down on the ground facing towards the Ark of the Covenant. They were disturbed over the look of their idol paying homage to the Ark of the Covenant. So they picked it up and set it back in place and went through the day. The next day, guess what happened? Dagon was again face down, paying homage to the Ark of the Covenant. They fixed it all up, but the third day, it was a little different. This time, when the idol had fallen down, its head and hands had broken off. 
At this point, the Philistines didn't know what to do. At the same time this was happening, a number of people around the city of Ashdod, where the Ark of the Covenant was being held, began to suffer. Look at this scripture, 1 Samuel 5, verse 6. Then the Lord's heavy hand struck the people of Ashdod and the nearby villages with a plague of tumors. Okay, this is really, this is where the junior high boy in me comes out, okay? I just want you to know this. That word here that is translated tumors is a very odd word in Hebrew. It can mean tumors, or it can also mean something like hemorrhoids. Now you see the junior high boy coming? God gave them hemorrhoids. Now the people of Ashdod uh, did not like this. You know really what it was? Since they got the ark, it was just a pain in the butt. That was funny. Yeah, good. So, they decided, let's get rid of this thing, and they sent it to Gath, another city. But that city heard of what a pain this ark was, so they sent it on. They didn't want it um, after they got the plague. So the leaders quickly decide they're going to send it to another town named Ekron. When the people of Ekron heard what was happening in Ashdod and Gath, they said, we don't want the Ark of the Covenant, whether it was skin tumors or not. They didn't want this. And so after all this turmoil, here's what the Philistines did, because they didn't know what to do with this thing that was supposed to represent God. They built a brand new cart and select a couple of cows to pull the cart, and they sent it on its way. They decided, hey, you know what, we're going to put this on here, and if it decides to go one way, we'll know that it's okay. But if it goes back to Israel, we'll know that the God of the Israelites wants it back. And so they sent it. And the ark ended up in Kiraf Jerim, where it stayed for about 60 years, 20 years during Samuel, or Saul's, or Samuel's time, 40 years during King Saul's reign. And the people of Kiraf Jerim respected the Ark of the Covenant, worshipped God, and did everything they could to keep the Ark safe. That's the background of why the Ark is not in the temple and with the people there. Years later, as we read last week, David becomes king of all of Israel, and he wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. It appears in Psalm 132 um, that David had a search party. He went looking for it and found it and located it. During the last years of King Saul's reign, the nation was on a spiritual decline, just like when they lost the Ark. After David becomes king over all of Israel, David searches for this Ark of the Covenant, and he's determined to bring it to Jerusalem. He wants to start unifying and bringing all the people back to God. He heard reports how the Ark of the Covenant has blessed this town, especially the family that's taking care of it, and he wants this to be in his family, his town, and in the rest of the nation. That's the scene. Now we're in chapter 6, 2 Samuel chapter 6. Verse 1, then David again gathered all the elite troops of, in Israel, 30,000 in all. He led them to Bala of Judah to bring back the Ark of, the, of God, which bears the name of the Lord of Heaven's armies, who is enthroned between the cherubim. They placed the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it from Abinadab's house, which was on a hill, Uzzah and Ao. Abinadab's son, were guiding the cart that carried the Ark of God. I walked in front of the Ark. David and all the people of Israel were celebrating before the Lord, singing songs and playing all kinds of musical instruments, lyres, harps, tambourines, uh, castanets, and cymbals. Here we see the beginning of a big parade, a celebration. David's got great intentions here. He wants to do things right and bring this in as a showcase into Jerusalem, make everybody see. He's got great intentions, but he makes some very grave mistakes. David looked at the ark, uh, not like he should have, but more of like a type of spiritual blessing box. He transported the ark on what? A new cart, a wooden cart led by a team of oxen. He surrounded the ark with 30,000 elite troops, and then he gathers around all them, all these great kind of musicians to sing and play before the ark in an attempt to appease God. This is a parade. 
It looks good. It sounds good. But where is all the focus? We're going to see God wanted nothing to do with this parade. Here's the king. The king in his own splendor. With his own troops. With his own band. Singing as he carries the ark that he found. I think David here is dangerously close to repeating the same sin that had happened back in 1 Samuel 4 and 5. He's dangerously close to casting the vision that once we take hold of this box, we're going to be unstoppable. The ark of a covenant. God has to bless me if I have this. It's my spiritual lucky charm. The message would be that all you have to do to appease the God and lower G at this point of the Ark of Covenant was to take this thing wherever you wanted. You could, in essence, manipulate God. You could move God from one point to another. You could decide where God would reside. By treating the Ark this way, it was lowering how they saw and treated God. With this, we need to learn something. Just because you are king, just because you have good intentions, just because you have the right intentions may not, does not mean anything. See, good intentions without wisdom lead to disaster. And his kingship starts falling apart. The king's supposed to do what's right, but last week we saw he messed up and the crown is a little diminished. This week, he, he's messing up. He's treating it wrong, and the crown is dented and diminished again. Good intentions without wisdom lead to disaster. David is a worshiper. He has written many songs at this point. David knows what it means to worship God, and under his rule, Israel is starting to come back to a nation that is worshiping, truly worshiping God. They're excited, and they think that's what the Ark of the Covenant means for them. What did they do? They took the finest oxen. They got a brand new cart. They, used, they had their finest people in charge of the oxen. Uzzah and Ael, the sons of Benadab, they've been watching over the, the Ark of the Covenant for years. They had the best, they, think about this, they had the best worship teams around singing and playing all kinds of instruments. It all looked good. King David, his army, his brand new car, his oxen, his special attendants, Azanael, and his worship team. They're going to create a revival in the land. It looked like they're going to usher in the presence of God, and these blessings are going to start pouring out onto David and out through him to everyone else. But good intentions do not always end with great rewards. Sincerity does not um, bring great rewards. I think of it this way. There are a lot of people who say, well, it's the intentions. It's what you think of it. Okay. If you really believe that, drink strychnine and think that it's fruit juice. Just thinking it doesn't change it. I can think I am the strongest person in the room. I think that. I've got the best muscles the only muscle I have is right here attached to my jaw. Just being sincere does not mean that it's fact. Or that it will in fact receive God's blessing. This is one of the reasons we need to read Scripture. It will help us understand that God has given us certain instructions and mandates. The Bible helps us to understand that God is very much concerned with the details of of our hearts, of our lives, of our relationships. What we'll see is everyone, even leaders, whether politician or king, must read God's instructions and follow them. We must read and obey. And it's very similar to our Sunday school lesson. You must hear them and obey them. How many of you ever tried to put something together without reading the instructions? 99% are males. Imagine that. Okay? Sometimes you say, well, I didn't read the instructions, I just looked at the pictures. 
And, and you think that's, that's still reading instructions. But there are times you need to sit down and read the instructions to know how to do it right. Uh, a week ago, I wanted to save money, and so I decided I'm going to change the brakes, the rear brakes on the van. And so what I did is I went out there and got to do it, right? No, actually, I went down, fed my fish, sat down in front of the fish tank, and watched a video on how to do it. And then I went out later that day, hit play on the same video, and did exactly what I saw and hit pause and would do it. I listened to the instructions, and guess what? They're working. The brakes work. Oh. I haven't changed the brakes in over 20 plus years on my own. The last time I did it, it was really with my father-in-law who was saying, do this, do this, do this. And then he moved me out of the way and did it right. Okay, that, that's the type of mechanic that I am. We need information if we're going to do things properly. You can't just wing it all the time. You've got to have the background information. If we want to know what God wants, if we want to know what God expects to be in His presence, then we need to read the instructions that He's already given us, which is the Bible. And after reading His Word, the best thing we can do is obey it. There is no other way around it. And here, in this scene with David, he failed. He failed. He had good intentions. He was sincere. He had great worshipers, but he failed to get into the Word of God to see how he was supposed to handle the ark. How to handle being in the presence of the Lord. If King, King David had read the instructions, the Torah, especially Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, he would have known the only way to move the Ark of the Covenant was for Levites to carry it on long poles, on their shoulders, not on a cart. It was never meant to be carted around, even on a great-looking cart. God has specific instructions how to move the tabernacle and, and everything within it. He had determined long ago he is not going to be put on some cart. He was going to be lifted up and elevated by the people who say they worship Him and honor Him. He was not going to be used as some military spiritual lucky charm. He was not going to be manipulated by elite warriors or worship teams. God is God. He is King of all kings and Lord of all lords. He is Creator, Sustainer, Lord God Almighty. He determines what needs to happen. And he determined long ago that his presence was going to only rest on his people that were created in his own image. Think of it that way. He wanted his presence on his people, not a cow. If you remember in the presence of the Lord on this ark, um, there would the presence of God would come and rest between these cherubim, would kind of make it look like a throne, and here they are held up by God's people. God had come to rest in this, not in a building, but this was a symbol to show He is with His people. We make the same mistake even today that, that David and his men did. That God has to rest upon this building or, or that building or this style or that style, this institution or that. We make the mistake that God has to rest on this ministry or not that one or, or this group and not others. We must always remember that God is in control, not, not us. He's sustainer, creator, redeemer, and Lord. His way is the only way to victory, and in case you've heard it otherwise, His is the only way to salvation. There is no other way. There's a key thought here if we'll receive it. I've repeated it a few times. God does not rest on buildings, carts, or institutions. He rests on you. He wants to come down and place His presence on each one of us. You're going to see this vividly in the day of Pentecost when the apostles have the Holy Spirit pour down on them and pour out of them. The Holy Spirit came to rest on them, the ones who allowed God to rescue, redeem, 
in Houston. So, verse 6 of 2 Samuel. They came to the threshing floor of Nacon. Uzzah put his hand to the ark of God to take hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord killed Uzzah. And God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there because, beside the ark of God. David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? Notice there what his focus was. How can the ark of the Lord come to God's people? No, how can it come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. How would you like that? Hey, this thing just killed a guy, so we're going to leave it here. I'm your king. Do what I say. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his, all of his household. David's just starting his rule of Israel. He goes to bring the ark. He's trying to do the right thing. He's got these good intentions, but he doesn't read the instructions. He, he doesn't do it the right way. He said he does it his way, based on his power, his army, his fortune, his talents. It's all about David. And David's arrogance cost Uzzah's life. And as I was looking at this, I started thinking, don't we do the same thing today? We think this song or that song is better than the rest. We think you have to dress up to this standard or not the standard to show you're holy. We think that a building must look like this or, or must look like that. We have to have pul- uh, pews and pulpits. Many times we turn the corporate time of worship to a formal time of entertainment or a chance to satisfy what we personally desire. When we do that, we are sinning. If you've ever come to a worship time, the corporate time, and you want to feel it, if you ever want to have your soul or your heart stirred, if you want to have anything to do with you when we come together and are supposed to be focusing on God, then you are, in fact, worshiping yourself. Good intentions. I came to church. But your focus is not right. We are commanded to stop worshiping false gods, which includes us. Thankfully, David didn't stop there, starting in verse 12. And it was told to King David, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord... Wait a minute. There's not an ark, an oxen, cart, or anything. When they bore it, that means he went back and figured out how to move it. When they bore the ark of the Lord, had gone six steps, David sacrificed an ox and a fat animal. And David, here is my favorite event of David. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord, with shouting and the sound of of the horn. David stopped and he learned the lesson of his mistake of doing it his own way because he caused the death of Uzzah. It was David's fault. He learned he could not approach God with the with the tarpings, the trappings, I mean, of his own military might or his own royalty. King David realized he's a fallen king. And he can't come to God equal. He had to go back to who God really is. First time he showed up with 30,000 elite soldiers. With all these worshipers and instruments. And yet here, when he does it the right way, he comes wearing a linen ephod. No royal crown. No royal robes. He leaves the troops behind. He brings only the elders and maybe a few generals. And he puts on the clothes of somebody who worships in true heart and mind and soul. He wears his skivvies. 
A loose way to translate this would be David danced before the Lord in his underwear. How undignified. He did it the dignified way, and it caused the death of Uzzah because it was wrong. David puts on the clothes of a humble person. He leads the way by worshiping and praising God. He leads leads the way as a humble servant, not a royal king. He leads the way not as a military commander, but one who is a servant to God. He leads this procession as one whose only purpose is to uplift the Lord. See, David learned humility and worship proceed the presence of God. He wasn't very humble the first time. He had the worship part. But the presence of God did not come until David humbled himself. Have we learned this fact? Have we learned that we need to be humble and we need to come and worship before we're going to be allowed in the presence of God? To come into His presence, we do this. Now, I don't know what you've been taught about what's dignified. I had a t-shirt once that said, I can dance before the Lord in my underwear. And I wore it to youth group. I was a youth minister. They don't have any scruples, right, Dustin? Yeah. He was talking to his baby. And this lady at church got mad. How dare you wear something like that? And on the back, it had the scripture reference of this. And I said, let's read this together. Right there in the foyer. And we read it. She goes, well, I don't like it. That was her reply. And I said, well, I wouldn't be dancing for you. It's for God. And she stormed away. We have this elevated idea sometimes. Now, does God deserve respect and honor? Absolutely. I am not. Hear me, please. I am not advocating everybody comes in their underwear next week. Okay? Because David's underwear was like a onesie that went down to his knees. Okay? Everything was covered. He was modest. So please don't do that. Okay? Please hear me. I'm not advocating that. He came humble without the royalties of the world. But just like that lady in that one church didn't like it, there's somebody who didn't like it here. Starting in verse 20. When David returned home to bless his own family, Michael, the daughter of Saul, that was his first wife, came out to meet him. She said in disgust, how, dis- how distinguished the king of Israel looked today. Notice that is, no, that, that's sarcasm. That is negative there shamelessly exposing himself to the servant girls like any vulgar person might do. She sees David coming down in this triumphal parade, leading the Ark of the Covenant. He's humbling himself. He's praising God. And she comes out to scold him. She is offended. She is shocked that the king of Israel, the elevated person, the person who's better than anybody else in this king, her husband, would make such a fool of himself in public. Have you ever been embarrassed by someone in public? Don't ask my wife. Okay? How did you respond when they embarrassed you? There was (laughs) my mom. It wasn't me. It was my middle brother. He got in trouble at church. And so she went to grab him, and when, you know, your mom has that look and has that finger grit coming for your arms, you know what's coming. And so we were outside on the steps of the church, and he took off and started running laps around all the people. And you know what we were all doing? Not me. What they were all doing? They were laughing. My middle brother was laughing. My mom's a little short, short, red-headed lady who was getting redder. She was embarrassed, and when she finally grabbed him, there was a look of terror on my brother's face. He had embarrassed her in front of people. How do you feel like when somebody's embarrassed you 
in public? How do you respond to them? Do you sit there and say, oh, well, that was a good try. Your intentions were right. Notice what she says. Notice what she said here. Notice that last line. She says, um, shamelessly exposing himself to the servant girls like any vulgar person might do. Michael has just belittled David even more. She's basically saying that this parade of worship was full of servants below. He was out there exposing himself for the people who were there, which were just servant girls below her. Menial. And in doing so, she belittles God. The time of worship that way was below her. She's above all that. She's a sensible person, a rational person, a dignified person, and, and someone such as her would never stoop to such lows or ridiculous forms of worship. And that exact same attitude, once again, is expressed today. People look down on others because of how they raise their hands during a song. Some people look down on others for singing old hymns. They say, how dare you worship God with those old, antiquated hymns? Some look down on others for showing any emotion. There, there was a time I saw, and this was a, a guy in his 60s, he was worshiping God, and, and all of a sudden he sat down in the chair, and tears were falling from his eyes. And a couple on the other side of the room, this is their words, they're shame. They belittled it. When we belittle forms of worship, like Michael did here, belittling worship is belittling God. When you say you only know, when you have the proper form, when you know the exact way to worship, and you belittle all the others, you are not worshiping God. You are again worshiping self, and you have belittled, you have lowered God. When we say that one way of worship is not valid because of our taste, we are belittling God. When Dustin started doing more and more over the worship here, um, there were songs that he kicked out of the worship sets, the, the lineup. Because they don't give glory to God, he said. And what's the purpose of this? It's to glorify and honor God only. Right, some of them were nice songs. They were good songs. We liked them. But the focus was not on God. And so he said, That's, we're going to get rid of them. We can sing them another time. But at corporate time, we need to come together and only honor and worship God. It is for God's glory, not ours. If a song repeats a hundred times and God is pleased about it, what, how dare us say anything about it? If a song uses an organ and a hymn, and we don't like it, but God does, how dare we say anything? I don't care if it's a harmonica and an accordion. If God likes it, Who cares what we think? Look what David says to her. After she comes and belittles him and belittles God. Verse 21, David retorted to Michael, I was dancing before the Lord, not girls, not other people. I was dancing before the Lord who chose me above your father and all of his family. Did you hear that? This guy who just danced in the ephod out there is above you. Because God chose me. You're not above all that. He, God, appointed me as the leader of Israel, the people of the Lord, so I celebrate before the Lord. Yes, I am willing to look even more foolish than this. Even to be humiliated in my own eyes, but those servant girls you mentioned will indeed think that I am distinguished. So Michael, the daughter of Saul, remained childless throughout her entire life. David quickly puts her in her place, reminding her, this has nothing to do with you. 
This has nothing to do with me. Even I am the one who is appointed by God, and I'll make a fool of myself if it brings him glory and honor. God is to be praised, whether it makes David look foolish or not. It is a dangerous thing to make fun of true worship. It is dangerous to be arrogant in it. It was for Michael. The Bible says that she had no children to carry on her lineage. Her brothers, and her dad's gone. They're already died. And there's no way that she can carry on a son now to carry on into the kingship that would be part of that lineage. But notice that it was David who humbled himself in worship in the presence of God, and God came to him. When there is true humility and true worship, when we come to God with all our hearts, our souls, and our minds, and our bodies, we will step into the presence of God. You want to know how to get into the presence of God in worship? It's right there. Humble yourself. And truly worship. We've got a little boy in, in worship who loves to sing loudly. And it is amazing and awesome. And every time he does, you know what happens? What happens here? Not once have I heard or seen anybody go, oh, he's off key. Not once have I ever said, oh, we cut off already. Instead, they all look at him with awe, with joy, with excitement. And I've even noticed that when he sings loud, do you know what happens to the rest of you? You start singing louder. It humbles us that if this boy can worship God in a true way, how dare we just mimic it or mind it? Let's do it. David learned that to truly come to worship God, he had to learn more about what God says. He had to go back into the scriptures and see, well, how do you handle the ark? How do you do these things? Remember, David's called a man after God's own heart. And part of God's heart is for us to seek after him. You want to be a person after God's own heart? Then seek after him. Let go of the worldly ways, even if it makes you look foolish in this world. We are called to be learners of God. And as we read, learn, and study, we'll know how to live more and more in the lifestyle of holiness. As we follow Christ, we will better understand what it means to live as a heart of God. And we'll be humbler in spirit and attitude, and we'll walk more and more in the presence of God. Then we'll be able to come and truly worship Jesus as our King, to submit and follow wherever He leads. Last week I asked you, who are you following? Because everyone follows someone. Whether you believe it or not, it is true. You've got someone you look up to you in the past, whether it's the Lone Ranger, some military leader, or your own dad. There is someone you follow. We are always following someone. And I asked, who are you following? Today I want to ask you a question. Who are you worshiping? Who are you focused on and worshiping? Some here, some in this room are worshiping false gods, the gods of wealth, power, prestige. Some are proclaiming to worship God, but are in fact not worshiping God, but worshiping themselves. Some are striving to worship God, but they, they don't know how. There are some people who are innocent. I just don't know how to do it. So who are you worshiping? Because just like everybody follows someone, everyone worships something. Your life worships something. It is focused and directed. What are you giving attention on? What do you focus your life on? When it comes to our corporate time together, when we all gather here together, what is your focus? A time where we're supposed to get giving praise and glory to God, is that why you're coming? Or are you coming because you're supposed to? Because that's what I've always done. Are you coming how it affects you? I'm guilty of that. There's times, man, if I don't go to church, it's just going to wreck my week. 
about your relationship or about our focus. If you're coming because of how it affects you or makes you feel, are you coming truly to humble yourself in the worship of God, expecting to come into His presence? David danced humbly, authentically, intentionally for God. He said, I don't care what any of you think of me. I'm doing this for my God. He laid down his broken and tarnished crown so that he could elevate the one true king. We started the service with reading of when Jesus' triumphal entry and they were laying down palm branches which was proclaiming he's the Messiah, the king. They were shouting out that he is the victorious one. They were proclaiming it. Just a few hours, they went from shouting him as king to shouting crucify. We are fickle. We need to quit picking up our crowns. We need to pick up humility and come before God. We're going to come together again for a time of worship, but before we do that, there are people here who are struggling with what it means to truly live that faith. And I'm not here not as one who's figured it out, but one who is trying to strive and look for it in God's Word and study it. And there's others in this room who are willing to do that. If you need help with that, back in that corner room where we're going to meet, we'll meet with you with prayer. We'll go to God together and we will see how we can study His Word, come before Him humbly with true worship, and then know you are in the presence of God. If you need to make that decision, won't you come today when we start singing again? Let's stand and let's pray. God, we praise you. For you truly are the God, the King, the Salvation, the Redeemer, the Holy Creator. And Lord, in our brokenness, in our sinfulness, in our conceitedness, we so often forget that you are also our King. Forgive us for wrongful ways of worship when we look at what our thoughts, our wants, our desires are. Forgive us, God. And help us to truly, humbly come before you in pure worship. For you are worthy. No matter what the world says, whether they call us radicals, they call us foolish. Help us to seek the approval in your eyes alone. And Father, as we get ready to lift our voices, show us your power. Show us your presence. Remind us of our place before the cross. And we thank you for what Jesus did there. And in his name we pray. Amen.